Welcome to the Freedom from the Struggle podcast. Here are your hosts, Anthony and Melissa. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Freedom from the Struggle podcast. I'm your host, Anthony. I'm Melissa. We want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. We have an amazing guest going to join us tonight. We think you're going to fall in love with her. She's a young woman with a story that is terrifying, <laughs> uplifting, tragic, all of those things. But by the end, you're going to see that God has, you know, through a, a lot of uh, horrible circumstances, has created a, an amazing young lady with a lot of promise. So we're going to get to that interview in just a second. Just a couple of quick reminders. Just want to let those of you who are not familiar with the podcast know what we do here. This podcast is a Christian paranormal podcast where we try to help people who are struggling with spiritual warfare, demonic attack, um, you know, just things that they feel that they would like to get some help with, but want to come to a place where they feel safe and not judged. That's what we do here on this podcast. So if you're new to us, just give us a try. I think this interview today is going to show you kind of what we do, what we're about. I also want to remind you that we do have a second podcast for those of you who are into um, the horror genre, maybe even the true crime kind of criminal uh, detective novel type stuff. I do have a trilogy of books entitled The Struggle Series. And right now you can go to the Struggle Series podcast wherever you listen to this podcast. And you can uh, listen to all of book one entitled The Struggle, as well as most of book two. By the time this comes out, we'll be uh, probably chapter 13, which is pretty close to the end of that book. And then we'll actually be beginning book three. Uh, probably just maybe a handful of weeks after that. And so um, if you're into, you know, novels with a twist, with a lot of different, you know, trying to guess who the real killer is, that type <laughs> of thing, horror genre, but uh -huh. is with a Christian feel to it, that's what those books are about. In addition, just wanted to remind you, you can find us on the socials. It's either Freedom From The Struggle Podcast or FFTS, but we are on most of the socials and we do put some TikTok videos out from time to time definitely repost a lot of stuff. So we want to just make sure that you follow us there. Um, if you are somebody who has a story or somebody who wants to reach out to us for some help, you can uh, DM us on any of the socials, Freedom From The Struggle podcast, or you can reach out to us at anthony at the struggle series.com. It's probably the best way to get to us because we have a team that reads through those emails and we will help you out in any way we can. A lot of the people that write into us we simply get them some resources and get them off to somebody else. But on certain instances, we decide to do interviews or at least read letters on the air and try to not only let um, the person who wrote in get some help, but also we feel that a lot of these topics can help a lot of people who might stumble upon this podcast. So that's what we do here. Um, Melissa, I have a question for you. Yep. After doing this kind of co-hosting with me for a while, what, um, what, kind of stories have stuck out to you the most or is there one particular story that you've listened to and maybe even before you became a, a co-host um you know what what kind of what kind of things would you tease maybe to a new listener to go back and listen to oh i would recommend was it javi yes did i say it right is it javi yes because <laughs> i think that sometimes i want to add a little extra Javier or something like that. Which is probably, Javier is probably short for Javier. <laughs> Javier. So I think it was episode, it was season one, maybe episode season three. Two. It was a, season two, maybe episode three. Uh, it was a letter that he wrote in about um, struggling with some alcohol um, and maybe just feeling like sad and depressed and almost like suicidal, like at some moments. And you know how he's just trying to take care of his family and his young kids. And uh, he listened to the episode that you did with Jay, the interview that you did with Jay and uh, the prayer that uh, Jay recited after you, after the interview um, and had that black smoke and things coming out of him. But I think he had a lot of familiar stories that he had with Jay that he kind of connected with. And um, actually a few weeks ago, we had some of the, um, the cast members um, that we've had a lot of emails asking about how he's doing, just kind of wondering how he's doing. I think he was, you know, struggling with 
you know, he didn't say anything about drugs, but I think most definitely like, you know, alcoholism and like how he changes when he drinks and it, how it makes his children's like uncomfortable and how he's struggling trying to change that a real hard worker. I mean, he was a great ladder, so I would recommend uh, if people can go back, but that's one that's been standing out lately. And so we've been actually praying for him. We have a prayer wall. It's actually a cork board. <laughs> We're not that big yet just to have a huge wall, but we have been praying for him. And so some of the other listeners that, you know, has like, so if you're listening, uh, Javi, give us a call or a quick follow-up email just to let us know how you're doing. Definitely. And I, and I think that, um, you know, Javi and others, cause we do have a handful of people that we've reached out to and either got back with us immediately. And then we haven't heard from them in a while. And we also have people that have written in and we're not even sure if they ever listened to the episode that we talked about. Um, but coincidentally it ends up helping other people. So it's not yeah, a, a exactly. loss, but we would love to hear from all of you who have, uh, we've read a letter on the air. We've interviewed you just to see how you're doing and how things are going there. But definitely I would recommend, um, hobbies episode as well as Jay's episode, because what happens is, is we get to a place where we, um, you know, they kind of tie in together mm -hmm. and it kind of just gives you an idea of who we're here to help. Again, as I said earlier, we are a place that doesn't judge. We don't, um, we don't really care what you did or what happened. We're not in a place where we want to, you know, make this about some theological, sinful, mm -hmm. um, correction type thing here. We just want to reach out to teach you about Jesus and his grace and his love. And so that's what we're doing here. So if you have a story that you're sitting on and you're afraid that, you know, this re retired pastor is going to tell you how sinful you are, um, you got this all wrong. You, um, you know, as Paul said, you know, that he's the chief of sinners. And I think that was, uh, that was true in his day, but if it were in our days, I might be the chief of sinners now. So <laughs> I don't judge people. I've been through horrible things. I've made horrible uh, decisions and sinned horribly that has affected, you know, countless people. And so we're not about that here. So if you're sitting on a story and you're afraid we're going to judge you, I can assure you we're not. And, um, you know, we just want to help you kind of get back on your feet get to a place where you're spiritually healthy and definitely help you with any sort of spiritual attack that you're struggling with because it's, um, you know, it's something that we want to make sure that, um, you know, we have mm -hmm. people understanding yeah. that the grace and love of Jesus Christ and the truth of God outshines all of these demons. And it's just about understanding that truth that gets us to a place where, you know, we can find our freedom. Uh, from the struggle. See where I got the title? See how that works? <laughs> so, um, and we respect, you know, the viewers and the people that write letters and also uh, the people that are so gracious to do interviews with us, their privacy. So we most definitely not going to harass them or, you know, but if just let us know how you're doing. And also, I want to give you thumbs up on we've had some good news about your, your books, the struggle series uh, on YouTube. You're getting a lot of likes and <laughs> you know, yeah. clicks on those. Well, we, what we, you know, I, I forget to All mention this often because we do release the, the freedom from the struggle episodes on YouTube and rumble with no, no real video. We just mm -hmm. have them there for people who might like that channel better, but maybe you're listening at work, but you still put it on YouTube. So we're seeing a lot more people listen on YouTube than we expected on the struggle series. We actually put out some light video. Yeah, we don't, um, really nice. we, I don't have the time nor the energy nor the expertise to do like full 100% all out video production on each chapter of the books, but we are seeing some, some, uh, responses to those too. So, yeah. um, make sure if you are a YouTube person or a rumble person, you can check us out there as well. So before we get too out of hand going off topic, I just want to take some time to address an issue that you will be hearing about in the news. Um, I'm almost grateful that we recorded this late in the week, later than we normally do, because of course, if you're listening, you are, unless you're under a rock, we had an uh, assassination attempt on former President Trump, who is now probably the leading candidate for president. 
and we don't really try to get political here by any means, Mm -hmm. but I do want to, I do want to kind of address one part of that, um, before we get to this interview. And I want to kind of really address the concept of spiritual warfare and especially one section of it, which I would call demonic brainwashing. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and I picked a, I just picked a random thing that was on a, a social media deal that one of the team members showed me and the, and I'm going to call this person out because I don't care. This thing says democratic Colorado state representative, Steve Woodrow had no sympathy for former president Donald Trump after he was shot in the ear in an apparent assassination attempt. The last thing America needed was sympathy for the devil. But here we are. And then I guess, you know, it goes on to say he posted (laughs) this on X Mm -hmm. after the the shooting that killed one and left two others in critical condition. Mm -hmm. When I read that, my heart was at unrest. Mm -hmm. Um, I won't lie to you. I'm a crybaby, but I was teared (laughs) up most of the day. Um, uh, This was would have been we recording this on a Sunday, so that would have been Saturday when it happened Mm -hmm. and I was actually working on some automobiles. Um, so I was covered in grease and when I was getting, I worked on them all morning and all afternoon. And when I got in the shower and I got out, you know, the news was on, there was things going crazy. All of the team was showing me social media posts, um, because we were getting ready to do a recording, which got moved to today. But what I'm saying is, is that my, my heart was broken and whether you're a political person or not, Um, one of the things that caught my attention was a woman who was holding her body over a young child. Mm -hmm. And then we've, then I found out later, you know, because it took a long time for this to unfold that there was actually a a man and he threw his wife and his daughter on the bleachers basically and covered them with his body. And he's the one that was shot and killed. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I read this letter or this little post from this Senator in Colorado, I, I, I can't lie to you. I get angry as my initial response, but then my secondary response is just to kind of weep because this person is so angry at Trump that he can't even put out a post that would even include the victims, the Mm -hmm. innocent people. And so I can only assume that there's a part of him that has no sympathy for the people that are at the rally as well. Mm -hmm. Now, whether you're on the right side or the left side, I don't really care at this point. There is a demonic attack that is launched against this country. And if you don't see it, I don't know who could convince you to open your eyes in a different direction because this is demonic brainwashing. This is a human being whether you don't like him politically or not, I could, I can understand that he, if you're on the more liberal side of the spectrum, there's a lot of policies and things like that, that you don't agree with. But I wonder how many people on that side of the aisle realize that there's a lot of policies that the Mm -hmm. people on the other side of the aisle don't believe in. And so to have this hate and this vitriol, I actually saw a deal this morning where the daughter of the man that was killed, who was shielding her and her, and her mother, is dealing with attacks from the media and otherwise that they they're saying that her their dad was too violent the way he threw him on the ground and covered him. And again, my initial response is please let me hear somebody say that in front of me because although I'm 53, I still probably punch you in the mouth. But, but that's the, you know, that's the, not the good side of me. Let's put it that way. My secondary thoughts are like, how could people become so brainwashed against another human being, Mm -hmm. you know, and how could they become so calloused to human life based off political ideation? Mm -hmm. And, and then I remember, what do you do right now? you know, with your time. Well, I host a paranormal podcast that talks about demons and spiritual (laughs) warfare. And then my, my senses come back to me and I realize this is, this is spiritual. And I want to kind of make you aware of something, you know, crazy. Now, you know, I've been called a conspiracy theorist on a lot of stuff and I don't really believe in any type of little coincidence, 
But I just thought it was funny that Trump was shot at 611 um, Eastern time. And it was 411 my time. I remember that. I'll never forget it. But in your head, you say, well, you know, is that significant? And I actually saw somebody post something that said, isn't it funny how Trump was shot at 611? And what does Ephesians 611 say? And that's one of my life verses. And so I'm going to read that. Ephesians 611 says, put on the armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the tactics of the devil. For our struggle is not with flesh and blood, with the, but with the principalities, with the powers, and with the world rulers of this present darkness, with the evil spirits in the heavens. And that's what this mm-hmm. is about. A man decided, and you know, I can really get conspiracy theory because there's a lot of that going around about Secret Service dropping the ball and letting a guy climb up onto a white roof in the midst <laughs> of people screaming, there's a guy with a gun there and nothing happened until after he took his shots. So you can go down that rabbit hole if you want. I probably will later. But if you just take it at face value, this man was so angry at a political person that he decided that he would risk his own life to be the person who who tried to kill him. And then I'm watching other media posts where people are talking about how could he miss? Like we, we had one shot at this. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, this is demonic it's people. Crazy. This is demonic. And, and, you know, if you think I'm on one side or the other, that's your business because you're already missing the point. I don't care which political person this is. There should be nobody trying to assassinate that person. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, that's demonic. And even in the interview today, you're going to hear how demons love chaos and how they love um, to get us all riled up in emotional, negative emotions, because that's where they thrive. And so what I believe you're seeing right now is you're watching this big demonic scheme launched against our country, the United States of America, Mm -hmm. and it's being played out in the fact that there's a hatred for one another and there's division. And so what I want to do is kind of transition from there. But when, when you hear me say this, there is a demonic attack against us individually, in our families, and then you can expand it from there in our cities, in our states, in our workplaces, And of course, in our country. And if you think that because somebody has different opinions than you, it's your right to kill somebody, you're wrong. You're demonically influenced. And I will challenge you and I'll challenge anybody. When you see a mass shooting or or even a suicide, those are demonically influenced. Mm -hmm. Those are demonically driven methodically constructed schemes against a person or people. And the devil can convince one person to do something to another in an effort to take them both out Mm -hmm. and then wound the lives of family members and, you know, secondary and tertiary people all over the place and then laugh at us. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to address that, that if you're a listener to this podcast, whatever side of the aisle you're on, pray, pray. And if you're not somebody who prays and you're just somebody who likes the paranormal aspects of this podcast, try it anyway, because we need help, man. <laughs> this is a crazy place. So yeah. with that being said, I want to introduce a young woman by the name of Gianna. And Gianna is somebody who is uh, an 18 year old. She's getting ready to go to college and um, she has uh, had a crazy life. And when you talk to this young woman, she is so adjusted and so intelligent that you almost don't want to believe what she's endured, but she has, uh, endured things that I guess maybe the world would give her permission to be an animal really. I mean, on paper, she could be on a completely different path than she is. And so I think what it does is it speaks volumes of her, her commitment to, making a better life for herself. But I also Mm -hmm. think it speaks volumes of God having uh, a hand on her Mm -hmm. and guiding her, you know, through some horrible circumstances and situations, but also uh, just maybe having some favor on her that I think you, (laughs) you will, you will understand when you, when we talk to her. Well, she has a beautiful name, Gianna. So yeah, definitely. 
Definitely. So Gianna, um, what I want to do is welcome you to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, no problem at all. I want to just kind of give you the opportunity to kind of share with the listeners your background a little bit, because you could probably tell your story over about a six straight day period with no (laughs) breaks and not cover it all just from what we know. So um, just give us kind of a reader's digest, but let people kind of know who you are. And as I always tell the listeners, just make sure we leave some names and stuff like that out because we never want to expose your identity as well as the identity of people that you may be talking about. So tell us about yourself. Um, um, I would say I'm just pretty normal. I've had, as you said, a crazy life, but I've done my best to just adjust you know, take my circumstances for what they are and kind of use them as a learning experience. Um, I've always been a little bit more on the quiet side, especially when I was younger. Um, In terms of my background, like you said, Reader's Digest, just quick. You know, my parents always kind of were a little rough, so separated early. Um, And then as things progressed, things kind of just got worse. My father ended up actually going to prison. And then in the midst of that, like the official separation um, between him and my mom. And then within that, there were some new marriages, you know, maybe some some women and men that I didn't like so much. <laughs> um, and then honestly, like just... Do you have any siblings? I do. That's my one, my saving (laughs) grace. Um, I have a lot of siblings, actually. Um, I have three biological siblings. And then um, at the time, as I was growing up, I had a couple of step siblings and everything in there. Um, Once again, some that I liked, some that I maybe didn't like so much. (laughs) Um, But yeah, kind of just everything's mellowed out the older I've gotten. So not much to tell me challenging having like step sisters and brothers and going through that at such a young age yeah I mean it was nice in an aspect I've always held my siblings really close to me Mm -hmm. and so kind of welcoming new people wasn't hard at first it was kind of exciting almost like here are these new people who will understand at least in some in some way what's been happening Mm -hmm. but it got harder I think as as things as progress. Members, yeah. Yeah. And then the family, family issues starts to happen. Oh, just like, yeah, just having to live with new people and learning, yeah, for sure. learning their do's and don'ts and likes and dislikes. And yeah, like, Hey, you got on my t-shirt. Hey, you took my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Get for out sure. of my lipstick. Yeah. My sister and I. Well, very good. So Gianna, tell us a little bit about your journey with Jesus. Um, in the midst of all this chaos, it sounds like you were at least exposed to, you know, Christianity and, and kind of had a knowledge of Jesus and have Jesus in your life. So in the midst of all of this chaos, of course, somehow you found Jesus. Tell us about that journey. Well, when I was younger, um, Jesus was a super huge presence in my life. My family was very involved in the church and all of that. And so I always, you know, knew and believed in Jesus, but as things got worse with my parents and my dad's situation, I think I kind of lost sight of all of that. I think I, you know, my connection with Jesus wasn't the greatest because it's, you know, that age old mentality of, you know, if, if he existed, why would this be happening to me? Sure. And so I think for a few years there, um, I really struggled with that relationship with him and my beliefs and everything because I had been taught literally from birth, you Mm -hmm. know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) what it was and, you know, who he was and who he was supposed to be in my life. But then it just seemed like all of that, like, crumbled almost. Mm -hmm. Um, But those few years where it was a little rocky there, you know, I wasn't doing the greatest. And so it took me a while to just step back and realize that's because I didn't have Jesus in my life. That was because I wasn't talking to him. I wasn't listening to him. There was, you know, just so much turmoil there. Um, But I did eventually realize like that's what was missing in my life. And I could, you know, sit there 
and complain about everything that was going on. But at the end of the day, all that mattered was my relationship with him. And that's how I was able to help myself and just, you know, not drown in everything that was going on. Sure. Now tell me, because, you know, we're old people, um, <laughs> what's it like to be, you know, cause you're coming out of high school, getting ready, going to college. What's it like to be a Christian today in, I guess, today's day and age? I know that phrase is even sounds <laughs> old, but what's it like to be a Christian nowadays in high school? It's, it's rough. Oh yeah. It's, it's rough. Most people who do believe are, you know, the stereotype really out there constantly talking about Jesus. So nobody wants to be around them. They're like labeled as like a weird Jesus freak. <laughs> and then I would say probably the majority of everyone else my age kind of leans towards the atheist point of view, which was definitely a shocker <laughs> going into high school. You would think that, you know, there would be some people with that same mindset, but it's very far and few between. And I have people tell me all the time, like, I can't believe you're religious. Like, I don't know why you would believe in all of that. Like, it doesn't make sense for your character, which not really sure what that means. <laughs> Pretty backhanded. I'm like, okay, don't, don't really have a response for that. Um, I've had people who know, like, you know, bits of my life story tell me like, you know, you shouldn't believe in Jesus. Like, why would he do this to you? Mm -hmm. It's all very, like, there's a lot of animosity when people find out my beliefs, which is disappointing. Wow. Sure. Yeah. But it's, it's hard. Yeah. It's, kids are definitely not, not in the same place as I was. I always felt. Well, you know, I think what happens is society evolves and you, you, you're my age where like in high school, I was part of fellowship of Christian athletes. And I would almost say that if you weren't Christian or at least religious, mm -hmm. you were the weirdo. Yeah. And just in the matter of a couple of generations, that seems like it's changed. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens is that's evidence of a demonic type of a spirit that has been launched against us because as a Christian young lady is talking to us right now, she's kind of astonished that people don't believe, but they're just <laughs> equally, if not more astonished than she does believe, but she's in the minority. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not only sad, but it it's indicative of some sort of methodical deconstruction of society. In my opinion, Yeah. do you, um, do you have like any, any like, um, I guess, uh, view of the other side, which are these hyper religious people that we kind of just laughed about a couple seconds ago. And, and what are your thoughts on that as well? Because you're somebody who grew up in the church and, but you seem like you're kind of more, uh, not more spiritual, not religion, not to steal a, you know, a cliche, but you seem like that. What are your thoughts on those hyper religious people? I think I have like a a certain respect for them, like to just be able to be, you know, so outwardly religious and so outwardly themselves. I think that those kinds of people kind of mold their identity to be that. And so I can respect that, but I also feel like there's a certain aspect that's harmful. And I think that certain things can turn people away from religion. I think that there's that church stereotype of, you know, the almighty God coming down hard handed and just <laughs> brutal and scary. I think that there's a really big element of fear. And in my experience with, you know, people my age, oftentimes they just scare people. Like that's the tactic to get them to believe is just pure fear. You know, you're going to hell if you don't do this and that, but it never comes down to just, you know, why don't you believe in God? It's always, why are you behaving this way? You know, what would God think of this? Mm -hmm. He would judge you. You would be condemned. Like, so I just think those kinds of people sometimes send the wrong message, especially at least with people my age. Well, I, I think it's that way amongst everybody because religion has put fear into 
the psyche of the Christian. And so most people worship God or follow God out of fear. And, you know, the Bible says perfect love casts out fear. Mm -hmm. And so God is perfect love. And so when I tell people that, you know, God is unconditionally loving, agape love is the absence of fear. And that's the love that God has for us. It's a one way love. And instantly you'll get people saying, well, what about when Joshua killed all those people in the Bible? Where was the loving God then? And that's what we talk about on this podcast. He wasn't killing humans. He was killing (laughs) hybrid Hybrid. DNA creatures Mm -hmm. that were out eating human beings. Like, you know, you don't know what you're talking about, but you'll get hardcore Christians who, who, still preach that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somebody says, does sin not send people to heaven? Of course it does. I mean, to hell, of course it does. And that's not what's going to win people. What's Mm going to win people is like, if you don't want to go there, Mm -hmm. there's this God who did it all for you and literally loves and adores you. Mm -hmm. How could he adore me when he killed all those people? You know, it's the same argument every time. And it's like, because you don't understand you've been taught. There's a, there's a famous preacher that's all over the place right now. I should say his name, but I try to be respectful. He is a well-known preacher and he's against, you know, he's a cessationist against the spiritual gifts. He thinks people like me are weird, but when he preaches, there is no happiness. There's no smile on this dude's face. There's no joy. There's no love. He is angry, (laughs) but he's got like zillions of followers and members of his church and people will like walk over broken glass for this dude. And it's like, he hasn't taught you about the joy and the grace of Jesus Christ. He's Mm -hmm. taught you about like, you better be perfect or God's going to incinerate you. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what you're talking about, Gianna. And I think that doesn't do a service, but let's give these kids some kind of, uh, I guess, you know, benefit of the doubt, because they're probably learning that from their Christian parents. Um, And so I'm saying all this, I think, because if you're listening, we're definitely not that here. Yeah. And so um, I think Gianna is somebody that we will, we will relate to the more and more we talk to her today, because you'll see that she's real. And if you, you want to know the people that we want to hang around with, I want people that are real. I want people that will, write in and call in and say the bad words and not try to make their letters perfect Mm -hmm. or their, or their interviews perfect, that they're honest and not, you know, not trying to taper it. When I was a therapist, I used to tell people all the time, you come to me for help, but you're not telling me the truth that, you know, (laughs) if I were a doctor, you're say, I'd say, why are you here? And you're like, well, I'm here because, you know, I have a ringing in my ear and I'm like, well, what about the arm that's been severed? (laughs) You know, like I can see it, but, you know, as a therapist, you know, we get people that are afraid to tell the truth. And I think even more so in the Christian world, but that's what we do here. And so Gianna, as we get, I'm kind of saying that for you as well, because as you share some of your stories here, we want you to kind of be, be as transparent as you can, because I think you're going to reach out to a lot of people. So I want to ask you before we jump to the stories, however, what are your kind of beliefs and thoughts about demons, spiritual warfare, that type of thing? And where did you develop those from? Um, I, so I've always believed in demons from like a really young age and it had nothing to do with how involved my family was in the church. Um, I've been seeing stuff since I was really young. And so it wasn't ever one of those things that like I need somebody to prove it to me. You know, I need some sort of evidence. No, it was something that I had always (laughs) experienced myself. So um, I've always, I've noticed, um, like we'll talk about a lot, that everything would come to light when there was chaos. So like there was always something there at at the times of my life that were the most chaotic. So when there was something crazy going on, it was reflected in my nightmares or it was reflected in what I was seeing around the house or what I was hearing around the house. Amen. I mean, I think you can just toast this podcast. (laughs) You're right. When, when there's chaos, there's demons. That's what it's about. So I agree with that hundred percent. Now you said you started seeing things from a young age, kind of give me maybe your first memories or your first kind of events and then how that kind of evolved. 
I think it all started like seriously um, with nightmares. I've always been a really vivid dreamer. And so I'm talking four years old, remembering my whole dream. Um, But then when my parents started fighting more, my dreams started getting more and more violent and more and more scary. Um, I think the first time that I saw something outside of when I was sleeping was actually, it was right before my parents officially split. Um, And we all lived in this house and I shared a room with my sister and my mom and dad had the room next to us. And outside their room, there was this linen closet. And I had gotten up in the middle of the night and um, my dad was by the linen closet And I don't know if this was some sort of like hallucination had to have been because obviously this didn't happen to him. But this is the first time that I saw what I called the fuzzies at the time. (laughs) Um, And they were basically just like if you picture a dust bunny, but just a big mass of them. So they would take on this kind of form and they were outside the linen closet. And I remember asking my dad, hey, like, what are you doing? It's the middle of the night. And he turned to me and he was, he just, you know, I spilled something in the room. I'm just getting a towel to clean it up. And as he was like rummaging in the closet to find a towel, these fuzzies just moved over him and they were just like swarming him. And I remember just being really panicked and it didn't seem like anything was happening, but I felt like I clearly was the only one who could see this because my dad was not panicking. He was still just grabbing a towel Mm -hmm. But I just remember just a really dark feeling like something was after him. Wow. That's uh, like, as you hear the story, you're, you know, my, my little, I guess, theological mind starts saying he was under attack Mm -hmm. and you saw it. You, you actually witnessed him being Mm -hmm. spiritually attacked and probably by default, the family was now, did you get the sense that these, what you're calling fuzzies, these little entities or whatever they were, were they aware of your presence? Yes, but it felt like they didn't care. Like there was not necessarily like a draw. Like I didn't feel like they wanted me to see them necessarily, but they weren't concerned by the fact that I was seeing them. So do you, in hindsight, have a theory on what they were? I mean, I saw multiple things in that house and it, they didn't, it didn't always manifest as the fuzzies. I used to have dreams of, you know, I was a kid. So the standard ghost, you know, like (laughs) clear guy who was carrying stuff around, like I would see different things, (laughs) (laughs) but looking at it now i can recognize it was all the same thing whatever it was that was in that house that was feeding off what was going on between my parents it was you know that demon that was there that was you know separating them causing the fights causing the tension in the house all of that it was all the same thing gotcha so this fighting that was occurring in the house Obviously, you know, it would be easy anyway for us to assume that it was affecting you emotionally. But at the time, did you attribute it to spirituality? Did you put the these entities and the fighting together or did that come later? No, that came much later. I just mm-hmm. honestly, because at the time I wasn't, I was like four years old. <laughs> So there wasn't a lot of intelligent thought behind, you know, mom and dad are yelling and I'm having these weird dreams. There was never, you know, like, oh, they're connected. And there was also never something where I thought like, oh, there's a demon in the house or we're being haunted in some kind of way. Mm -hmm. There was never any of that. Like, I didn't really recognize what I was seeing until I was older. Mm -hmm. And the reason I ask is because as a young child, I started seeing things. My earliest memories are as as four as well. And I guess probably that's just because that's about the time that humans start remembering stuff. But my family even says I was probably seeing stuff way before that. But 
it took me decades to realize <laughs> that that there was chaos in my life at the time. You know, my mother and my stepfather um, were always fighting. There was always chaos in my house. It was like like a like the only peace times we have is when they were at work. And then mm-hmm. once they were home or on a weekend, it was chaos 80% of the time. So I, I think I can kind of resonate with the fact that you're they're they're mutually exclusive at the time and you don't realize that they're related till later. Yeah. So were the fuzzies, I guess, only attacking your father? Were were they around other people? I only ever saw them attack my dad but they definitely were around the whole family so my my sister will probably laugh if she ever listens because I'm sure (laughs) I freaked her out um to no end but there was one time um, my sister had her room in the basement and I was just walking down there I'm sure I was going to get something who knows but I heard banging on her door and so I stopped and was listening for a second and I could see a little bit of the fuzzies <laughs> peeking out from under the door. So at this point I had been seeing them here and there. So I kind of almost wasn't really that scared of them, mm-hmm. but I went upstairs and I told her that the fuzzies were trying to get out of her room, <laughs> 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 which I'm sure she didn't want to hear from me. Um, I'm sure that was a fun, a fun night going to bed, but yeah, no kidding. It was always, just throughout the house. It was never, you know, one area. It was never one person. It was never one time of day, oh, one wow. time of night. It was just constantly somewhere. Did so you... was it shaped like a human, like Not to be that a... big or they were just little fuzzies, it like was... a little. Yeah. So it was never as big as a human. It was like, you know, like those big bouncy balls you see at the store. Mm-hmm. It was like that size, but it was just like a lump of them. Oh. And it was never like any specific shape or shape. anything. Okay, it, they okay. just like moved around real fluidly mm-hmm. together. Oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah, and I'll probably address that a little bit later, but my theology is there that demons will manifest in ways to be seen by people to get a reaction. But I also believe that there's people gifted to see things and our minds don't really know how to make sense or our vision isn't quite all the way open. Mm -hmm. So Gianna's story of seeing these little things probably is just a, maybe a semi manifestation of something. Mm -hmm. And then her, her young mind, you know, you can, you only have a certain repertoire of (laughs) thing categories you can put things in as the way, the more old, we, uh, you know, the older we get, the more we have like different names for things, Mm -hmm. but a four-year-old would say they're like little fuzzy little balls that are moving together (laughs) together. because that's all you have in your vocabulary. So, but I believe that you were, you were watching something that maybe wasn't trying to manifest, but you can see it with, with your gift of discernment, but Mm -hmm. we'll cover that in a second. So you say your parents split. And so obviously you're probably spending time in two homes did stuff continue? Um, here and there, it definitely died down some. Um, when I was at my dad's, for the most part, it was pretty calm. Every now and then, if some family visited and there was some sort of fight, like there would be something here and there. Um, but in terms of activity, I saw a little more at my mom's house. Um, when I was over there, she had her mom staying with us and nobody really got along with her. Um, and there was just a lot of tension and fighting there. Um, not only between my mom and her, but also her and my siblings. Um, so your grandmother and your siblings. Yes. Um, there wasn't anything too crazy. I do remember frequently, um, the house was hardwood And all of our bedrooms were in the same hallway. And we would, anytime we would be in the living room, which would have our backs to that hallway, um, there would just be this really loud stomping, like as if a big dude was walking down the hall in like work boots. And (laughs) yeah, 
I never saw anything, but that was the main thing is just random intervals. Did you just other hear people stomping. hear it? I think my sister heard it, but beyond her, no, I don't think so. And how were you around that time? Just like to see how it's grown. So you went from like four, maybe eight, seven or eight, six, maybe six, six oh, or wow. seven. Like, yikes. So, so now you're you're kind of growing up then you said your father went to prison so obviously emotions in the family are you know probably all over the place Mm -hmm. did did you notice activity increase and i don't just mean external activity but you know in my theology you'll also demons will start attacking you internally as well Mm -hmm. kind of tell us about that little journey yeah so um, when my dad went to prison for me personally, um, I wasn't really told anything because of how young I was. So it was one of those things for me where I could tell something was wrong. And obviously my dad wasn't there. So something was really wrong. And just, you know, reading what everyone else seemed to be going through. I knew it was really serious and I knew the gist, but I never truly understood what was going on. Um, until a little bit later in life, but internally everything going on on top of not being told the truth, it was, that was a rough time. And I definitely think that that was capitalized on, um, those, those were the few years where I completely just stepped back from God. There Mm -hmm. was, you know, when I was alone in my room, there was no thought of God. I used to pray every night before bed before my dad went in. And then after that, it was silence. Like I had no desire to have any kind of relationship with him. Like I felt that relationship went with my dad. So internally it was really hard. And I definitely think that that I didn't realize it at the time, but that was a huge attack on me. Um, And then externally, I think everything also just got worse. So what do you mean by that? Um, When my dad went in, we actually shortly after ended up living with his new wife, um, my stepmom at the time, and one of her daughters. And they clearly had their own stuff also going on. So their chaos paired with our chaos, it was living under... Fuzzies all over the place. (laughs) Yeah. And I think it was around that time that I started seeing whatever I feel was attached to them. Um, Mm. So I feel like they had some kind of entity that was feeding off of their own stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was around the time that I started seeing whatever that was. And what, what did you see? Uh, I think the first time that I saw it, I was with my stepsister at the time and she always in any house that we moved in had the basement and so as a young kid obviously I loved going down there and just watching movies playing with her I was really excited to have like a new sister um but she we lived in this townhouse and she slept in the basement it was just a small little room and a bathroom but we were watching a movie and we had fallen asleep and when I woke up I looked at the end of the bed and there was just, it was a man I could tell by like the, like the stance, Mm -hmm. but he was just all black. So it was just like one big shadow man at the end of the bed and he wasn't moving. I couldn't see any facial features or anything. He was just standing there, but it didn't feel like he was watching me. It felt like he was watching her. Wow. What did you do? I went back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> did you ask her about it? Did you tell her um, you, what you saw or later on? Not at the time. I didn't have to. <laughs> Everyone else in the house was also experiencing things. So it was a pretty small house. Oh. And I would kind of switch beds that I slept in. Mm-hmm. And I had slept in her mom's bed one night, my dad's wife at the time. And I had woken up to the same thing. And like, once again, it didn't feel like it was watching me. It felt like he was watching her. 
And oh, that next day I had told my brother because I wasn't quite sure if I trusted, <laughs> you know, my dad's new wife and her daughter, but I knew mm-hmm. that I could always trust my brother. And so I had told him and he had told me that he saw something really similar. So I knew that I wasn't alone, at least with him. But then as time progressed, it got more and more vocal, I would say. And so everyone started experiencing stuff. So we would, you know, be in the basement and the sink would turn on and we would all just be petrified, run upstairs. But it was almost like unspoken. We wouldn't talk about it. (laughs) Like it was if we acknowledged it, then it was real. And Mm -hmm. so we all just kind of kept our mouth shut and just hoped that it would go away. And how long do you think that continued? Years years every and it was every house that we went to we had moved a lot and so the first time that we moved out of that townhouse it was okay you know maybe maybe it'll get better maybe it was just wherever we were um because it's you know you want to believe that it's the house not the person but then we moved and it followed us and then we moved again and it followed us again and then we moved again and it was still there so it was clear that it was something that was attaching Now, that's what I find amazing from your story, Gianna, and other interviews and letters that we've received so far is when other family members can see it other than just one person. Yeah. So that's kind of how that manifests. Like, that's intriguing to me. Like, and it's scary. Like you said, your brother saw it, but he was afraid or not comfortable to say, hey, did you see that man standing there? Yeah. Or like an unspoken as if like they knew they had something attached to them or it was attached to them for so long that it was normal. Like it was a part of their lives. And I think like, that's one of the, the kind of the humorous aspects of skepticism is, you know, a skeptic is real quick to say, well, this young lady's telling her story right now on this podcast, but how do we know she's telling the truth? But when five or six or three or four or even one or two other people see something. Yeah, like the ghost that I saw at my friend's house. <laughs> yeah, your skepticism holds no weight, uh-huh. but they'll still try. But it's, you know, I guess your only argument is, is this family is a bunch of liars and just made up this story that they've told to countless people throughout their lives for no financial benefit just because they're attention seekers. Like at some point, we we as human beings have to stop being in denial that mm-hmm. there's another realm besides what we know. Whether you yeah. want to be a Christian or not is a whole other thing. Mm-hmm. But so as Gianna's explaining this, other people are witnessing this. One sister hearing the footsteps she heard, at least a brother seeing the same entity. Now, what about uh, your stepmother and stepsister? Were they aware of these? entities so for a long time i didn't ask him didn't say anything just (laughs) kept quiet hope maybe it was in my head um but the first time that i brought it up to my stepsister was actually pretty jarring because i had you know spent another night in one of her basements and i had seen the man again um and he was she the house that we were in at the time it had a huge basement and she had like a futon positioned in the corner. So there was a little gap behind it. Mm -hmm. And it was about, I don't know, 15, 20 feet from her bed. And I had woken up and it was just the TV on. So the rest of the basement was pitch black and I could see him. And so that morning after I woke up to that again. I was like, (laughs) okay, this is enough. Like this is the third house that we've lived in together at this point. You know, there's something up. I have to know if she's also seeing it. So I'd asked her and she had almost gotten excited. And she was like, yeah, that's Mm. my grandpa. And I I was still pretty young. So there wasn't something, you know, that I knew. But I just felt really off put. Like, I wanted to look at her and say, that's not your grandpa. Whatever that is, is not nice. It is not loving. It is not protecting. But in her mind, 
she thought it was like she like i said was like elated like oh you see him too and it was just such a strange experience because i don't even know how long she had been seeing him at that point then so you're you're saying that they were obviously aware that something was going on but they had attributed it to the grandfather and so were comfortable with it yes but because of what your your spiritual vision was showing you that you were 100% certain this wasn't a loving spirit of a grandfather that was protecting Mm -hmm. them you felt that you knew this was evil (laughs) yeah yes for sure and it was the longer that i lived with them the more i realized why they thought that but also what was going on because every time that i had an experience it felt familiar like it felt like whatever it was knew it was welcome there was never a sense of like fighting or a sense of trying to break down some sort of wall, it was clear that whatever it was had already implemented itself in their lives. Wow. You see, you see listeners remember when I was describing this young lady that she's very intelligent and there's like a little theological brain going on there (laughs) because that's exactly what it is. And, and, and I don't know if you fully understood that. I'm not trying to say you didn't, but in case you didn't, she's saying that, in her belief system, which is also mine, that spirits have to be welcome in. Mm -hmm. And there was a, there was an understanding in Gianna that this spirit had already been welcomed in. And so there was no resistance to it being there. Sometimes when people are starting to have a spiritual attack, the thing is still trying to get in. It's still trying to find the little cracks and crevices to climb in. Mm -hmm. What I hear you saying, Gianna, is this thing, was not only in, but it was welcomed in and could just show up at will. Yes. Now, did you still feel that it was not quote unquote coming after you? It was still just kind of, kind of part of their lives. Were you afraid of it or was just something that was, that you saw on a regular basis? Well, I was terrified of it. (laughs) Yes. It for sure scared me, but it almost felt like like a dog you've never met before Mm -hmm. like you know its owner lets you into the house so you have to be okay in some sense but i don't quite trust you yet that's kind of how it felt okay like it wasn't directly after me but it i didn't feel like it was watching over me i guess the way that it was them them okay so as your, as your life progressed. And so this thing has now become familiar, uh, to you. And I don't mean that in terms of a a familiar spirit attached to you and your family, it was attached to them and their family, but you're now kind of merging families. So, (laughs) so as it became familiar, like, uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is it became a normal event in this now blended family. Tell us kind of some of the things that kind of you know, maybe as it progressed, some of the things you saw, some of the things that you experienced. So back to that same house with that big basement, I think the first time, this was the first time I was genuinely like, you know, blood went cold, terrified. Um, Because this was the first time that it had done something to me while I was completely alone. So for the most part in the beginning, it was always when I was with one of them. So if I was sleeping in my stepsister's basement or if I was, you know, upstairs with my stepmom, there had always been somebody there with me. But at this time, um, my stepsister had just gotten a new dog. And um, she had to go to work with her mom but they didn't have anyone to watch the dog so i said you know i'll stay with her it's no big deal like you guys are just going to be a handful of hours so it was she was a new puppy so of course she wasn't potty trained or anything yet so they just had they had a pretty big kitchen and they just would gate her in and so i was just hanging out with her in the kitchen waiting for them to get home and the way that the kitchen was laid out there was two entrances to it um 
split by a counter. And so if you were sitting on the ground on one side of the counter, you couldn't see the other entrance. And it was pretty late at night at this point. I was the only one in the house and I knew that nobody was going to be home for a couple of hours. Um, not my stepmom or my stepsister. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also had a stepbrother who was going to come home later at night, but I knew that they said that they were going to beat him home. So I was sitting there and I'm just on my phone, minding my business. And I heard this really deep voice call the dog at the time. And he just said, baby. And this dog got up and immediately went to him. But (laughs) I, and it, you know, my initial thought was, okay, my stepbrother's home. But then I, you know, took a step back and I was like, I didn't hear the door Door open. open. And then I got up and there was nothing there. But just the way that her dog immediately went to the voice, like there was no questioning. There was no, oh, who is this dude in my house? You know, dogs barking, mm-hmm. growling, trying to protect who's this new person. No, she. it was so familiar to that dog. And then I was completely alone in this <laughs> dark house. Who knew when anyone was going to get home? I was <laughs> terrified. Um, and I would say after that was kind of like a shifting point where I think it also got more comfortable with me and my siblings in the house. So it was never violent, I guess, um, until a little bit later, I would say it was just a little dormant, mm-hmm. but it, like I said, it just felt like so familiar. Well, you could, you can understand if you were to tell your stepmother or your stepsister, that story, the dog went right to him in this deep voice. They would say, well, that's grandpa. grandpa. Yeah. Right. But yeah. you and your spirit knew that is not grandpa. That is not your grandpa. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to, I'm going to have that phrase in my mind. That is not grandpa. Maybe we should make our <laughs> freedom from the struggle t-shirts. That's a great marketing idea. Jen. Maybe our freedom from the struggle t-shirts would say that is not grandpa. Um, so I digress. I don't, we shouldn't be laughing at such a scary story, but I know, sorry. so, so now you are living with your mother. I mean, your stepmother and your father. Um, so now you're going against two houses. So your mother, uh, your biological mother, is she remarried at any point? Yes. So she got remarried. Um, so I would actually switch between my stepmom and my mother. And so at the time that I was living with my mom, um, she actually did get remarried to another man, um, which then brought in him and his younger son. Um, And at first it was, you know, pretty normal. Here's mom's new dude. You know, what am I going to do? But then that also kind of had a switch. He started out, you know, real cool, laid back. And then over time, he kind of just got crazier and crazier. Um, And with that came more activity, naturally. Um, I never saw anything um, when they were married and we were in that apartment. But I had awful nightmares when I was in that apartment of something just always being there. Hmm. The theme, there's a theme there for sure. What about at your dad and stepmother's house? When I was talking to you, when we were first talking about this interview, you said that you guys moved out to a property where it was you and your dad, your stepmother and your stepdaughter. And you said there was some events that kind of maybe there, cause that's where kind of the culmination of this stuff happened. Tell us about that. So the first time that I experienced anything in that house, it started with the nightmares, naturally. Um, It would, there was always just like a sense of panic. They weren't always necessarily scary, but it just felt like something underlying. Like there was just something off that I couldn't always put my finger on. Um, And then I would have these nightmares and I would go downstairs to go get water, whatever, and, you know, dark house. And it started, I would smell this really strong cologne when I would walk by the door to my stepsister's basement. 
and it was just, obviously I knew it wasn't my dad's. I knew what my dad's cologne smelled like, and he was the only other man in the house. Mm-hmm. So that freaked me out right from the jump. I quit going downstairs <laughs> um, <laughs> at night. <laughs> but then there was also another time, which this was definitely more violent than it typically was, but we were all sitting on the couch and just, you know, watching TV, not doing anything crazy, nothing outward was going on, I guess. And we heard the door, one of our doors slam really hard three times in a row. And it was one of those things where I think you're talking a bedroom door. Yes. Um, it was alarming and it was one of those things, you know, how do you ignore it? But also what Did do you, you guys do? all just like look at each other? <laughs> yeah. Just one of those, you know, <laughs> everyone else hear that. Cool. <laughs> so was this in the daytime? Was this in the nighttime? No, this is just middle of the day. Just. So I'm guessing your dad was home from prison. Yes. So he was, yeah, yes. Really, okay. Yeah. So everyone's in the house. <laughs> so at what point, at what point did, these things, I guess, stop or at least, you know, kind of dissipate? Was that at the divorce or was that? Yes, for sure. As soon as, you know, that became clear that that's what was happening, that they were going to get a divorce and, you know, me and my dad were going to go our separate ways, whatever. Um, it definitely died down a lot. It, we While we were still in that house, it was definitely still, you know, a little tense and everything. Um, obviously going through a divorce and splitting a family is not easy. But as soon as me and my dad moved out on our own, it was silence. I honestly didn't know what to do with myself. It had been a really long time since I'd lived in a house where there was nothing going on or even just like I walked into our new place and it I didn't feel creepy. I didn't feel like there was something there. And honestly, I hadn't felt like that in years. Wow. So, (laughs) I mean, we we don't want to let your dad off the hook. It sounds like he's, you know, part of it. Um, and poor guy, I hate to pick on him, you know, he'll probably listen (laughs) to this, but, but, you know, he's, you know, welcomed in some relationships, you know, and everybody's, there's always, there's always blame on both sides. So we're not saying it, that it was your stepmother and not him but it seemed like you guys walked into a situation where there was a familial spirit Mm -hmm. attached to your stepmother and her family. And the second that that was removed, you kind of had the peace. So theologically I'm sitting here saying that, you know, the chaos and maybe even to some extent, the motivation for divorce or the family not ever merging Would you say that, like, I'm thinking that there was at least a big demonic kind of uh, shadow over this family, marriage? I don't know what you want to call it. Yeah, for sure. I think so. I think, obviously, they've been pretty comfortable with what was going on on their end. And then I think, you know, me and my family coming in, already having a ton of baggage, there was already, you know, a pretty messed up situation. And so all of our stuff on top of their stuff, it was uh, kind of doomed from the start almost. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts in hindsight? And what I, what I kind of want you to get to, because, you know, time, time just ticks away on these podcasts. (laughs) What, what are your thoughts on like the spirit realm? Like now that you're older and you've had all this experience on spiritual attack on demons kind of give us your theology i think a lot of it has to do with like you said like chaos but also what someone allows i think part of why everything went on for so long was because there was never a desire to get rid of it because they were so comfortable with you know what was around the house and what was going on there was never any desire to to pray or, you know, maybe we should think about what's going on. It was always, oh, here he is, you know. Yeah. That's great. Mm-hmm. That's just – and then I think also, you know, fault of me and, you know, my family is 
we also were comfortable just okay well let's not talk about it then Mm -hmm. and so i think that this demon just had full access to everything i think that he was welcomed in originally and then nobody ever wanted to kick it out and so i think that and then it just was constantly able to feed off of the chaos of this fight and that fight and you know, somebody's not happy about this. Let me get in their ear and tell them how unhappy they really are mm-hmm. and how they should deal with it. And so everyone was just okay with letting that happen and listening to the demon. Well, I'm going to say something here that maybe is controversial and maybe will piss some people off. You know, I was a therapist for decades and, you know, I did several different types of therapies, different clientele, but definitely spend my time on the couch with couples who were struggling and, you know, all of the therapy, what they call theoretical orientation, which is like a style of therapy. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody writes a new book and has a new style of therapy and it gains traction and now is implemented as a new therapeutic intervention. Mm -hmm. The vast, vast majority of them focus on personalities Mm -hmm. and conflict resolution but very few of them and definitely none of them outside the Christian church focus on spiritual attack. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a therapist who would sometimes counsel people that were secular, non-Christian, you know, we, we didn't talk about these things. We would just talk about, well, you know, she yells at me every time I get home, but she doesn't realize how hard I work and she's got a list of things for me to do. And she's saying, well, you know, he comes home and all he wants to do is sit on the couch and I've been taking their kids all day. That's a typical, you know, I used to, you know, (laughs) buy my kids Christmas gifts off of that same argument (laughs) over and over and over again, client, Uh you know, couple after couple, but nobody stops and thinks you once upon a time, loved this person. You once upon a time, loved everything about them. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you like hate each other. Yeah. It's not really your personality, is it? Because you knew, you know, unless you were in complete denial of who this person was, something has gotten in between you mm-hmm. and has pointed out the flaws and the the things you shouldn't like. To me, that's spiritual. And so as Gianna's talking, I'm sitting here saying her dad brings his own demons, mm-hmm. her stepmom brings her own demons, and the familial spirits in the families, it was kind of maybe doomed from the start because although there may have been Christianity in the mix, Mm -hmm. there wasn't, you know, a full understanding, at least on one side or both sides of just how set the demons were Mm -hmm. on, on uh, taking apart, you know, a marriage. One of the biggest things that the devil will attack is marriage. Why? Because God implemented marriage in the garden. The very first union spoke about in scripture. And more importantly, God officiated that. And God uses his relationship with us as a marriage. We're the bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so it's something very beautiful that the devil wants to take apart. And so he, he's been after it from the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. So if these demons are trying to, I, I always call it like herd you away or you know, cut what they, what the Cowboys call cut you away from the herd. Mm -hmm. You know, they're a good cowboy can take one calf and cut it away from the herd without disrupting the other herd. Well, if these demons were trying to do that to Gianna, your stepmother and your stepsister and stepbrother, you know, to eventually destroy them. And then they were trying to do that to you and your father and your siblings you know, individually. And then all of a sudden this group of demons gets together in a household. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's why, party. yeah, that's why I always say, and, and if you've ever hear anything I say on this podcast, those of you who are into the paranormal and you're not a believer, you will still agree with this. You want to see demonic manifestations go where there is chaos, wherever you see chaos, I can, I can guarantee you in, in, in a way that, you, that we, neither of us could prove, but I'll still guarantee it that there's demonic influence there. I once upon a time watched an episode of The Dead Files. And if you've ever seen that show, 
it's pretty popular. It's kind of changed a little bit, but this woman named Amy Allen, who's a psychic and this, uh, kind of tough, uh, detective or former homicide detective from New York named Steve DeShavi. Mm -hmm. They go do these split investigations into these homes and then they get together at the end, not having talked and see if they found similarities. It's pretty entertaining and, you know, no offense to Amy, sweet girl, but she's definitely got some weird theories and stuff. I, you know, of course I'm come from the side that everything she sees (laughs) is demonic and she says it's not, but Mm -hmm. one of my favorite episodes of that show is she walked into this house and it was trashed. I think it might've been a trailer or at least a small, maybe double wide or something. And she said, before I could even come in and help you, you got to clean your house. Mm -hmm. And it's almost embarrassing in a way, but these people knew a network camera crew was going (laughs) to show up to their home (laughs) and they didn't clean it. Nobody, even if you're the dirtiest person in the world, if you knew that a camera crew was going to come in and your house was going to be on national television, that would have been the one time you cleaned your home. But she told them there's so much chaos here that we can never fight this. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I mean, I screamed amen. And like I said, I don't always agree with Amy's assessments, but I was like, you nailed it. As soon as they walked into the home, my the initial thought in my brain was there's a demon there. I mean, there was boxes and, and, you know, no offense, but like, if you see a hoarder Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, people wouldn't associate that with the spiritual attack. There's that show hoarders where they bring in these world renowned psychologists and it's entertaining because I don't care how good that psychologist is. Those people don't want to let go of their stuff. And, and, and the family is like, it's a piece of Kleenex, throw it in the trash. <laughs> and they're like, but you don't understand what that Kleenex means. And I'm sitting there I'm screaming. Use it. Yeah. I'm sitting that, you know, my boyfriend from third grade it gave that to me shade. and I can't let it go. Yeah. And I'm sitting there screaming. There's a demon that's attacking that person. It's tearing them apart internally. And you're seeing the manifestations of that in this chaos. Hoarding is just chaos. And so I, I kind of want to move to wrap up on that is that this chaos theory cannot be disproven. You, you may disprove a lot of the things I say on this podcast. And, you know, we, we have to get to a point where if you could grasp that statement, you will understand if, if you're listening and you're like, well, you know, I don't know, just put it in somewhere in the back of your brain. And the next time you go to your friend's house and you see a bunch of chaos, ask them how they're doing. Cause you're not going to meet somebody that their life is great. And then there's chaos Yeah. because chaos by default, even if you want to take the spirituality out of it, it's a chicken in the egg. Mm-hmm. It's destroy. The chaos is filtering into your internal or is your internal damaged and it's manifesting as outward chaos. Mm-hmm. If you go to somebody's house and it used to be immaculate, And it used to be clean every time you went and you was like the envy of the home. And now you go there and everything is torn up and in disrepair. I will tell you right now, I'll I'll bet you a hundred bucks. If you start talking to that person, they're under massive spiritual attack. So Gianna, now that life is kind of evened out from what we talked about before you jumped on, on this episode, it seems like the chaos has subsided somewhat. Um, how do you feel spiritually and especially compared to looking back? I feel much better to say I feel better (laughs) is definitely an understatement. Like I said, when I first moved in, um, to that place with my dad, it was like shell shock. I didn't know what to do with myself. Almost too quiet. (laughs) Yes. Yes, for sure. I didn't want to relax because I felt like it was kind of a trick, (laughs) but (laughs) now that I've realized it's not a trick. I'm just so much better. It's so difficult to just constantly live, you know, walking on eggshells. You know, I don't want to make this person mad. I don't want to make that person mad. I don't want to, you know, catapult an argument. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that because it's constantly tense. Like it's just with chaos become like comes fighting. It, you know, comes the anger. It comes isolation, like all of that 
just follows the chaos. And so once I was finally able to step back and, you know, regain order of my life and order of my emotions and Mm -hmm. my surroundings, it was just like a breath of fresh air. I could talk to Gianna for hours and hours and hours because she's told stories here and we know of others when we were talking to her before. So, you know, again, we could have done this over six straight days with no break, but maybe she can come back after you getting ready to leave for college, right? <laughs> yeah. Maybe a follow up a year maybe, later. <laughs> yeah, Maybe that's what we'll do. <laughs> see how things are going. <laughs> now I definitely want to get to these two questions in the agenda. However, before we end this episode, first question is as, as you sit here as somebody who's, you know, an adult now coming out of this mess what would you tell somebody who is younger, who is going through right now, what you went through, what advice would you give them? My biggest thing would probably be don't ignore it. I've always had the mentality of, you know, I'm just hearing things or it's just the wind or it's just the house settling, (laughs) but ignoring it it never makes it go away. You know, it can make it a little less scarier if you don't acknowledge it. But I think I probably couldn't have benefited from, you know, acknowledging what was going on, taking a step back and thinking, why is this going on? And what do I need to do to stop this and protect myself? Gotcha. And what role has God played in you coming out of that and, um, you know, being in a better place, not just because the place you live is quiet, you know, no spirits, but Mm -hmm. that's also indicative of the fact that you are in a healthier place because as you said, they would have followed you. So Mm -hmm. what role has God played? I think mainly just stability. I think by mending my relationship with him, I was able to just, I guess, mellow out my life. There was there's no sense of fear now. There's no sense of panic. There's none of that now that I have a strong relationship with him. I think stability is obviously the counterpart of chaos. And so I think by having that stability with him, I have that stability in my life. Stability is the counterpart of chaos. <laughs> G- I've learned more from Gianna today, folks, than, G- than Gianna's right ever going to learn from we me. We need to put that on yeah, the t-shirt we have, as well. We have, we have like, bumper stickers and t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> I still like the, this is not your grandpa better. I mean, I can, I can visual that. I think I'm going to get on my, I think I'm going to get on my meme generator this week and, and, uh, and make a, make a meme or something like that. Yeah, we have a friend that makes some t-shirts. That would be, yeah. <laughs> but, like a- um, but, but all kidding aside, yeah, thank you're, you. you're getting ready to go to school in the secular world in college um, away from your dad, away from your family, away from your stability. And in my humble opinion, that devil is, that's where he lives. If you found stability in your home and you and your dad have healed, and that's, you know, where you live now. And even, you know, as you told me, you've healed the relationships with your mother and, you know, your siblings, everybody's kind of tight there's stability there. Now that chaos is kind of minimized. However, you're about ready to go where chaos <laughs> is not only thrives, but I would say chaos is the norm. How do you protect yourself? How do you go out there in the world and keep not only God close to you, but keep the peace that you worked all these years to obtain? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so this whole process with college obviously has not been smooth sailing. It's, it's a very hard process. It's a very stressful process between not only figuring out what I want to do with my life and what path I want to take, but where I want to do it, who I want to do it with. Um, but I've noticed that even though I'm under a lot of stress with this, I'm also excited. I'm equal parts excited. And I think that that's because I'm just, letting God guide me. And so I think that when I get Mm -hmm. to school, it's going to be tough, you know, being in a new place, not knowing anybody and being away from my family. But I know that God's going to be there with me. And that if, you know, when I'm stressed out or when things get crazy, if I just take a step back and think, what does he want me to do? Mm -hmm. Where does he want me to go? Um, 
and it also, I guess, helps. I'm going to a religious school, so I also know that there's going to be plenty of opportunities, plenty of groups and clubs where yeah. I can find like-minded people and I could just take these opportunities for what they are rather than be scared and then let myself spiral into disorder and everything. Sure. And and although it's a religious school, there's still going to be of course, yeah. the college shenanigans. So, and you know, I'm never going to be somebody who, you know, is, you know, you got to go there and be perfect. And I, you know, and definitely that's for you and your family to discuss, but, but it's also one of those things where you, you know, I wouldn't, I would do you a disservice if I didn't at least attempt to speak into your life. My, here's my three things, prayer with God. And I think a lot of times going back to what you said earlier, you know, you have these hyper-religious kids at school and they, you know, they even pray lofty. I call them lofty <laughs> prayers, right? Uh-huh. And when I was a minister, I could remember, you know, my early days, I, the way I dressed and the way I behaved, you know, and I'd say, please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, highest in the heavens, <laughs> you know, please look down on it. You know, that that nonsense. And 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 if that's how you talk. I think that's perfectly acceptable. By the time I was done being a minister, I was preaching in jeans and t-shirts and uh-huh. just totally bucking the system and, you know, trying, maybe trying to be too young, but at the same token, not trying to be that lofty guy because mm-hmm. God had shown me that prayer to him is communication. Mm-hmm. And yes, there's a reverence, you know, like if you were going to your dad, you don't walk up and say, Hey, bruh let me talk to you, you know, (laughs) at least, you know, some people, I guess, do talk to their dad like that, but, but, you know, you approach him, Hey dad, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. But you don't say, you know, Oh, father of mine who, (laughs) who took the time, you know, from his busy life to conceive me and to raise me from such a young (laughs) child, you know, but that's how we try to talk to God. And that's why I think Mm -hmm. people fall short of having that true relationship. So, my first suggestion would be to pray to him and pray to him real. Yeah. Yeah. I'm learning how to pray, like just being with you. And like my youngest brother, he's um, a minister now, maybe going on three or four years. And uh, maybe a year ago, he's like, I'm really just learning how to pray. It's like, what? But you're right. Like, like what you were saying that you feel comfortable about ready, excited, kind of a scare, you know, be away from your family and finally, on your own and making your own decisions. Like, um, eight years ago, I just woke up one Tuesday mornings when I call life, God talks (laughs) to me one Tuesday mornings. Like I wanted to move to a new state, just kind of like start a new beginning and woke up one Tuesday morning and God said, okay, you pick a place. I'll get you there safely. And I said, for real? He said, yeah. (laughs) And I picked a place and I made that decision. And when I made that decision, I was so comfortable with it. Like my family was, kind of up in air about it. They're like, are you sure? Like, where did that come from? You never talked about moving before, but I felt so comfortable because I felt like God was with me making that decision and making that choice. And I haven't regretted and every, everything was just smooth. I mean, there's been some bumps in the roads, you know, here and there, but you know, God was with me and I felt so calm and like everything was going to be okay and just went for it. And here I am. And that's, and that's what prayer is. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's a two way communication. Mm-hmm. And so you pray and then you wait for the answer. And, you know, I've had this question throughout ministry a thousand times, maybe more. Mm-hmm. Well, how do you know it's the voice of God? Well, it's more, it's easier than you think. And people get mad when I say this, but <laughs> you know, God, should I go here? You know, well, I don't know the answer. Well, you know, what are you praying for and what is being said yes to? Mm-hmm. Because half the time, you know, moving to another state, you know, you do have to wait to hear from God, but God, should I go to this party um, at this college with these three girls that take pills and, <laughs> and, you know, do drugs mm-hmm. when the voice in your head says, yeah, go, that's not God. <laughs> <laughs> right. That doesn't mean that God is telling you not to be friends with those girls and teach them about him through subtle relationship, Mm -hmm. but it's not God telling you to go to a party where people are going to be acting a fool. 
And if God does send you to that party, what voices are in your head at that point? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if you see a sad girl sitting on a couch and you hear a voice say, go talk to that person. Yeah. Like God told me to give this guy at Dollar Tree $20. I was like, no, I just want it off a scratch off lottery <laughs> ticket. That's my money. If I give him $20 and I walked over to him and said, God told me to give you this $20. I didn't say it that way, but. but and you know, <laughs> that guy might be sitting in a church somewhere going, I never believed in God and I needed money. And some lady came and threw 20 bucks. At me. But that's what I mean. You, you kind of know the answer already when you prayer. So that's number one. Number two is read your Bible. And my only advice to this, because I'm real people nowadays, especially with, with tablets and phones, Mm -hmm. people will say, well, I don't need a Bible. I have it right here in my phone. Well, that's cool. If you actually read on your phone, there's people that, you know, well, I'll read it on my Kindle. Well, do you have an account with Kindle? No. You're not going to read it on Kindle because you don't read anything on Kindle. Mm-hmm. So if you're a book person and likes a, a paper Touchy, yeah. book like in front of you, it. something you can touch, then buy a buy a Bible. And I think everybody should have one anyway in case the power goes out. But <laughs> if you are somebody who reads electronically, then read and read like you're reading a story. Mm-hmm. I've watched so many movies that are amazing. There is not an epic movie I have ever watched that is a better story than what's in the Bible. Mm-hmm. The problem is, is people don't know how to read it because religion has made it one of those things to where you're reading it to figure out how God hates you. Yeah. But there's crazy story. There's a story in the Bible. There's a story in the Bible where a guy is out there and sees these dry bones that come to life. And I think of the story, the mummy, remember the mummy yeah, like yeah. where all those like dry bones, bones and stuff became these creatures that were chasing him. Mm-hmm. The Bible says that really happened, mm-hmm. you know, let alone Jonah getting swallowed by a big fish. He was dead in that fish. He came back to life. No, he wasn't. He was alive. Oh, he was alive inside of the stomach of a fish, you know, And we start debating on how crazy the story is. And the story is crazy in and of itself. But what if Mm -hmm. that happened? What if a sea parted? There's epic stories. There's a story of a prostitute who saved these spies that came into a city by climbing over the wall. And, and like, like it reads, if you read the story, it reads like a novel. Mm -hmm. These people narrowly escaped because the most unlikely person in the world saved them. The person who the Christians would hate who the, I'm sorry, the, at the time, the religious people hated became the hero of the story. Yeah. Read that Bible, Gianna. And number three, most importantly, keep close to the people who are supporting of you in your goals, dreams, and your faith. And when you find friends there, you know, you, you, the world will teach you to find like-minded people. Here's the problem. The most welcoming place on planet earth is not church. It's the bar. (laughs) Prove me wrong. People who are listening, prove me wrong. You can walk into a bar right now, walk up to a bunch of strangers, start having a conversation. It doesn't require social skills. It doesn't, you know, and, and if you want to be sad and alone over there in the corner, nobody comes over and wants to intervene in your life. They just go, yeah, I've been there, done that. So there's, there, there's so little judgment in a place like that. Uh-huh. That's what church needs to be. So if church is not that, we have to create that environment in and of ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I am somebody who very much follows uh, what people would call conspiracy theories. And, you know, I have a lot of people that would call themselves my friends that think I'm crazy to some extent. <laughs> but now that like the world is unfolding in front of us. They're, they don't think I'm so crazy, but mm-hmm. I definitely surround myself with pe- with like-minded people who at least are entertaining what I'm saying because God is putting these things on my mind. This mm-hmm. podcast exists exactly. because we're in the end times mm-hmm. and we got to have a voice uh, in every corner of the world that is telling people that you are under demonic attack and these things are trying to get at you because there's an ultimate goal of Armageddon that's yeah. going to, that's going to come sooner than later. Mm-hmm. And so if we're this little corner, we hope it's other voices in the corner. And so Gianna, your, your place in this <laughs> is to find 
these like-minded people that you can be real with, not perfect with, but real with, Mm -hmm. you know, Hey, I'm struggling today, you know, and somebody going, Hey, let me take off work or let me come home early and let's talk. That's more godly. And that may come from somebody who isn't necessarily religious, but those are the people that you need to be around because that's where the enemy has a hard time infiltrating. Mm -hmm. But if you have friends that are not supportive and are fake, but they're fun, the second that crap hits the fan, those friends actually become detrimental Yeah, because they'll, wow, let's just go drinking or let's go do this and see that God of yours doesn't exist. And all those voices Mm -hmm. you heard when you were younger, how could God love you if, if your dad went to prison and there was these divorces, that's the devil. Yeah. Yeah. Those were the people in your life that blew it, not God. And so it sounds like you've come out of that. So thank you for your stories. Yeah. Um, some creepy stuff there. <laughs> um, the fuzzies, the, the fuzzies. Um, thank you for the great slogans <laughs> that we're going to steal from you. And, uh, thanks for being vulnerable. So yeah, thank um, you for we, sharing. we definitely want to, um, just remind people that this is what we want here. Um, just come on relaxed and tell us your stories and let's talk about life a little bit. So Mm -hmm. before we let you go, Gianna, we're going to say a quick prayer for you as you go out into the world. Okay. Okay. Father God, this amazing young lady has decided to come here and share her stories in an effort to help people who have been in similar situations. And God, I just praise you for always being a presence in her life, for being patient with her, for allowing her to, to be angry with you and pull away from you, but staying faithful and staying right by her side, no matter how much she endured. That's who you are, God. That's the real Jesus. That's the real savior of the world that doesn't give up on us, even when we give up on him. And so God, I just pray that you continue to keep her close to you. I pray that you continue to guide her in her dreams and goals and visions and aspirations, but also in her pursuit of you become more real and more evident as she grows in not only maturity, but in her education and in her, her life. And I pray that you would surround her with amazing people, bring people into her life that would enhance her and not uh, bring her down. Uh, Pray for her busy schedule and homework (laughs) and all those stresses. God, I pray that she would always remember to give those to you as well. And I just pray for her family, pray for all that they've endured you know, who cares the mistakes they made? Um, it's more along the lines of the family healing and recovering because they turn to you. And so Jesus, we just thank you for that. We put this young lady in your hands and we hope to one day again, hear from her soon Mm -hmm. and hear how school is going and maybe more crazy stories, but definitely no fuzzies, God. So we just thank you so much for uh, giving us this platform and for having Gianna with us today. It's in Jesus name. We pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Melissa, we're going to, uh, definitely, um, remember the fuzzies <laughs> for the rest of our lives. So great to have Gianna with I us. Know, that was so much fun. Yeah, that was definitely a fun interview <laughs> and yet creepy at the same time, as amazing as that is. We just want to thank everybody for joining us here on the freedom from the struggle podcast. We are so glad that you joined us. Make sure if you have a story of your own that you reach out to us, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Freedom From The Struggle podcast. Make sure to subscribe, tell your friends, and we will see you next time.